Welcome everyone to Game Theory. Uh, that's where the logo is and we have an important announcement this week. We got our first comment. Faithful um, uh, listener, watcher, Mr. Uh, uh, thanks for uploading. Hallelujah. There's a reason why we're doing this, everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm done. You're muted, Martin, and I'm... <laughs> ah, here we go. Now there is exactly one reason why we're uploading these videos. Thank God you had that. Like, I wish that came a little earlier. I was like, oh, I don't know what to say about this. Anyway, perfect. One reason. That's all we need, though. Okay, so um, in this week on Game Theory, uh, we are going to, I guess, go over section... Uh, one of chapter five, right? Chapter five is that, that's the chapter that we're doing. Um, and yeah, so so you were saying, Martin, you were saying that on page two hundred and twenty-one, there's uh, it says that it, it gives the reasoning why for every um, for every mixed strategy Nash we can find a um, Nash equilibrium, and that's because they have to be compact and convex sets. Um, why? Why is a pure strategy not convex? Why? Why is it not a convex set? Um, well, because, uh, and I don't have like a super great argument for this, but um, if we if we think of the choices available to the uh, players existing in some like abstract space then like maybe we have a bunch of options here um and i mean it, it might even be a continuous blob of actions here uh, especially now when we're considering games that have an uncountable number of uh choices or strategies available to us but like it could be the case that there is a blob over here and there's another blob over here with things that we can do um, but there's not necessarily you know an action for us to take in between here uh, and so in order for a sex to be uh, or a set to be convex we need for every two points in the set a uh, line between them and if we pick a point here and a point here, then um, that red little dot won't be lying in the set. But if we do allow um, mixed strategies, then that sort of expands the set into us uh, assigning probabilities to different uh, strategies, and then we can end up in the red area by assigning a certain probability to the two uh, strategies. Cool. So that that's kind of the reasoning for this, yeah. Awesome. And and were there any other were, were there any uh, like the the first part of this chapter went over a bunch of those problems? Like, do, do we want to like go over one of those problems or? Um, um, I don't know. How do you feel about that, Thibaut? Because we did some similar problems and, and I feel like um, you kind of employ the same strategy for all of them. But how do you feel about the mess you were not with us when we did that? Um, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not family, familiar with, the, with what's going on in these chapters and maybe just, just go over the things you think are important in here and uh, I'm I'm happy with anything basically I think. Okay. Um, but but you know think, like the by, by the way um I just I just looked it up and and what you were just talking about uh, reminds me a lot of the what is called a uh, convex envelope where you you take a set of like a set and then you augment it with any convex um, 
yeah, any like any line between any two points of the set, and you end up with something called convex envelope. So I think that's basically what's happening between pure strategies and mixed strategies, right? I don't know about convex envelope, but it seems interesting. Yeah, it sounds like what we're doing. Um, I haven't heard the term before, but that makes sense. Right. Like essentially you're taking uh, different sets, unintersecting sets, and then like the envelope is like the, the kind of... Uh, yeah, or, or if, you, if you take like uh, the set of having like zero and one, then the convex envelope would be like the segment uh, zero one with any any point between the two, and you can do that for any like any set, right? Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, as long as you have a metric on it, I guess. Uh, yeah. So it seems like the convex envelope would then be the smallest set uh, that contains all of the points of the thing that you're taking the envelope on, and is also convex. I'm guessing it has such yeah. universal property. Yeah. Yep. Nice. So yeah, maybe just go, go over the things you think are, are useful in the chapter and I, I'll just shout if there's anything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I mean, it's, it's a lot of um, taking the derivative uh, on the payoff function with respect to the valid variable that you control. So the the variable that corresponds to your strategy set. Um, and uh, the example that they go through in detail, uh, or I mean, they go through many examples in detail, but the one which is called, uh, it doesn't have a name, but it's just example 5.3, is pretty um, highlighting of, of what the procedure is like, I think. Do you, wanna, you have, uh, sorry? do you wanna take us through that? Sure. Let's see, Let's see how I can share my screen. There we go. And here we are. Do you all see me? Or my screen at yep. least? <laughs> Good. Um so there is going to be an election and there are two politicians and they can place themselves uh, on the left right spectrum which is a spectrum that goes from zero to one um, and there is a continuous probability density function called f of x that um, represents where voters stand like which percentage of voters um, uh, lie, where they lie on this scale from zero to one. And there's a nice picture here. Uh, did I scroll through it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, here it is. So like, um, here we see the probability density function of all of the voters and uh, as a politician we want to get the maximum amount of voters and uh, then a person will, will vote for us if we our position is closest to uh, their position so if you're a voter and you see two politicians then you're going to select the one that is closest to your position um, and that makes our payoff functions for the two politicians. Um, the probability that, well, so if, if uh, politician number one is more to the left than politician number two, then uh, he or she will get any vote from a person that um, is in between in position uh, politician one and politician two or below or, or to the left. 
Um, and if the two politicians are at the same position, then you get half of the votes or like there's a 50% chance that they will vote for either of you. Um, and you know, similarly, um, if a uh, person or politician one is more to the right than politician two. And so another way to look at these probabilities um, is just that I think is actually a bit easier is just to see them as the derivative. Um, so the probability of a particular voter um, ending up below a point B in this uh, spectrum, like we think of B being here maybe, is just the integral of the probability distribution um, up to the point B, which is what we're seeing here. And so to um, figure out the Nash equilibrium of this, we uh, simply take the derivative of uh, the function. Well, actually, where did they do that? Let's see. Uh, okay, they don't really go through this uh, with the same method uh, that I was talking about earlier with by like, taking the derivative. It's just like an informal reasoning. Ah, I see. Um, but I mean, as we have done it before, uh, as you might expect, the Nash equilibrium is where the two politicians yeah. end up on the same position on the uh, left-right spectrum because that's where they get the most amount of votes. Yeah, and there's like, there's the, the logic, the reasoning, the informal reasoning, I think is like, you know, if one politician is uh, outside of the center, then to improve their score, they can go further into the center. Um, and then the other one, if they're like outside of the center to improve their score, they can go further into the center. And so it kind of like converges on the center point between the, the you know, splitting the voters into ha in halves. Um, and that even goes for um, like when you have many politicians, right? Um, then they all are kind of competing to get closer and closer to the center, um, which is I think something that we went over in our second video um, if you want to like go in, go into that um, more deeply, there's like a, a, a explanation of doing that with multiple different uh, with like a, a spectrum of you know n politicians. But um, I thought that we had the result that if there were three politicians, then there was no Nash equilibrium. Oh yes, that's true. Damn, that's. That's why I got to review this stuff. That's interesting. Yeah. But how could there be no, because it's a continuous game. So there's, it's not a finite mixed strategy. So there doesn't have to be a Nash equilibrium. And then. Um, so I, I think the reasoning was this, uh, like if we consider all of the players so this is not a proof, but this is a proof for why them all being in the center is not a Nash equilibrium. Because if they are all, uh, if they all are in in the center, then if then they all get a third of the votes. Um, but if one of them moves side out like just a hair to the right, since they have positioned themselves in the middle, then that person is going to get virtually half of the votes because half of the voters are uh, to the right of them. And so then that's a better strategy for that person uh, to get half of the votes than to get a third of the votes. So, um, well, at least that shows that them all being in the center is not a Nash equilibrium, uh, but that's not a proof that there isn't a Nash equilibrium. So I don't know if we did a proof that there isn't any. Um, 
I mean, there should be, right? Not necessarily. It, would it be like that they become equally distributed um, across? I don't think so, because um, like the, the two person, the two politicians on the side always get more votes if they um, go to the middle and like pick additional votes from the politician in the middle while maintaining all of their votes that they have on the flanks. So, oh, okay, I see. Because you're, you're getting votes by being, is it, 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 you're getting votes by being further, uh, the, the voters to the left or right of you are voting for you? I mean, if you are the person who is furthest to the right, then you're going to get all of the voters that are to the right of your position. Um, so wanna, you have them secured. You always get the voters um, that are closest to your position. So, for instance, if you had, right, if you had a spectrum, um, something like this, right? Dump, dump, dump. Whoops, that was really bad. Those are just poorly spaced lines. Um, oh, gosh. The world's changing under my, my, uh, okay. So if you had three, right, imagine that these are all equal, right? These spaces are all equal. Um, first, a voter at this position, I mean, a, a politician at this position, what, what uh, I mean, a, oh gosh, um, what would a, uh, a voter right here do? Who would, who would the voter right here vote for, this one? Yeah, the closest. So it's the closest. So, oh, the, the politicians on the flanks will always squeeze in, right? Yeah, you're right. And then it'll screw up the whole Nash equilibrium because you'll have like politicians at the flanks and then people are going to reshuffle and it'll like so when you when you reason about that, you always um, assume that the other politician at the center is not going to do anything about that. Is that the way you is that is that okay to reason with everything else equal? So this would be for non sequential games, right? So if you had a sequential game and you were to like assign a negative um, payout for like misbehaving, right? For instance, if you go against kind of the, the, the equal split, then someone else is going to like, you know, there's going to be some other kind of negative uh, outcome. Then, uh, well, I mean, I guess, I guess your question was kind of different where it's just more just like... Yeah, I think, I think my, my, my question was more, I think it's very general. Uh, it's about uh, when you reason about that and try to analyze what happens when A moves on your, on your diagram. Do you allow B to move on the left side of A if A is too close to the center so that B would get all the votes from the left, right? So, so I mean, if you're looking at Nash equilibria, then uh, in order to verify that something is a Nash equilibria, then um, you need to verify that each player individually um, does not benefit from changing their strategy and and so in particular, that means that if you have a set of strategies, like choices for all of the players that you want to uh, consider whether it's an Nash equilibrium or not, then you need to, then you can fix all of the other okay. players' choices yeah. and you look at your choice and, and see if that's your best choice when all of the other players are doing their thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay. and you do that for all of the players. So, so yeah, you can fix them one at a time like that. Um, but the point is that in this particular scenario, I mean, since uh, A has a better choice, then it is not a Nash equilibrium, regardless of how the situation looks for B and C. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and it, even the confusing thing that I found is that like, you're thinking about it, um, it's not really happening in sequence. 
it's more just like all the players individually evaluating what they can do versus what the other people are doing. Um, and there's no real, it's like, there's no time. Time is not a, yeah, okay. a variable. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so um, there might not be a pure strategy equilibrium for this game uh, because the utility function for three politicians is not continuous. I mean, in the, in the scenario that we talked about before where they're all in the middle, um, then damn it. Why is my pencil not working? Okay, here we go. Like yeah, there, there would be there would be a step between one third and yeah, and exactly. And so, like, if, if they're right here, then then if they are uh, right there plus epsilon, then they get all of a sudden uh, half of the votes rather than uh, a third, which is not a continuous mo motion. Um, yeah, whereas whereas in the in the two candidates case it's just just one one half um, even if you jump from the middle yeah. yeah yeah well in fact it's like less than a half if you jump from the middle yeah but it's continuous right uh, well I mean not in all uh, scenarios like if if you were um, if you were to make a bad choice from the beginning yeah. then like uh, you could have a huge shift so like let's say that they have both chosen to be at this position and like majority of the voters are all here um, then layer two here approaching from uh, the right is going to go from virtually no voters to half of the voters all of a sudden and that's also not going to be continuous um, so I don't think that we can um, assume that it's going to be continuous in this case, or I mean, we cannot. Um, I, I mean, it depends on the dense of the on the the function you have for the probability. Yeah, but in the general case, uh, even if the function, I mean, in every there is there are functions uh, that are continuous, mm -hmm. such that the utility function is not yeah. continuous. So, uh, yeah, we don't have that in this case. But it's also strange, like, um, because in the scenario where we are considering the three-player case, then uh, when all the other players are in in the middle, then you need to just shift by as much as it's strange, like you need to shift your position with an infinitesimal, basically, and I don't know, it gets into these uh, calculus uh, deviations that might not be relevant to like many real situations. But anyway, that's a little digression. So, did you ever? Did you actually get a chance to install Gambit? I totally forgot um, about that. Yeah, I forgot about that too. Dang, that would have been so cool. It is yeah. a shame. Because that's really what we should be like. I mean, w I, I think the, the, the point of this textbook, which I think it does it really well, is like getting an understanding of how these things would be solved and then being able to like use your general understanding to reason while you actually like let Gambit do your dirty work. Yeah, definitely. I mean, nobody wants to be solving linear differential equations like this <laughs> without tools like Gambit. Yeah. Cool. So, what other are there other questions in this um, thing that we we know or um, should go over? There's another example. I think they go over the uh, beauty contest, uh, just as we did before. Um, let's see if I can find the number. So interesting that our other textbook kind of went straight into these continuous um, games. Yeah. It's it's pretty interesting. Uh, it was more dense, definitely. That book, even though 
there were some substantial issues of it. It was like pretty deep dive into the career parts. So another thing that I thought was cool was Bress's paradox. Uh, example 5.8 on page 227. Can you share your screen? Sure. So, actually, can I? Where am I? Oh, there you are. Cool. Uh, here. Press paradox, um, which is like a fun example of a game where you can add an option for the players and it turns out that the Nash equilibrium is a situation where they are all worse off. So the problem will add a resource that should allow the players to the, reduce their cost but in fact, in fact makes things worse. Um, and so the situation that they go through looks like this. Um, a bunch of players uh, want to get from A to B and they have, well, in the first scenario, um, they can only choose between going this way, like from, from A to C and then C to B, or uh, from A to D and then D to B. And the time that it takes to go from A to C and B to D are both constant at 45 minutes. and uh, the road from A to D and C to B have some um, traffic uh, congestion issues so that um, it is a function, a linear function of how many uh, players are traveling along that road. And like if, uh, and then we're going to add this little uh, teleportation device that <laughs> lets us get instantly from um, C to D or D to C. Is this a, uh, is, is this like a, no, it, this doesn't, this dotted line doesn't have any relationship to information sets from oh, the no. previous chapter. No, it's, they call it a zip line um, and it's, we should think of it just as a road that we can take which is instant uh, the reason why it started is because, I mean, it's added in one of the scenarios and it doesn't exist in the first. So like in the scenario where this uh, zip line doesn't exist, then, uh, I mean, as is intuitive, there's no difference in these two, two paths. Uh, and therefore, uh, the Nash equilibrium for a bunch of players is just that half of them take uh, each road uh, because whenever there is there are more players taking the left path, then the right path is going to be uh, quicker, and so it's going to even out, and everybody is going to take um, any road that less people are traveling on. Um, but when we add this new option for the players, when we add this little zip line, then like starting with, okay, um, like if, if there are 2000 drivers, then things don't really change. Um, well, they do change because like we can get there faster by taking this road. Like if N is 2000 and this is going to be 20 minutes and this is going to be 20 minutes. And so we can get there in 40 minutes and that's great like that was way quicker than before um, but if we have 4,000 drivers then um, so first they would take uh, A to D um, because this would be 40 minutes and 40 minutes is quicker than 45 and since this is basically the same point now then uh, they just consider whether they should take A to C or A to D and so 40 minutes before taking A to D 
Uh, and then they would do the same choice here and zip over and take the road uh, from C to B. So the total travel time would be uh, 80 minutes. But if they had just gone half and half, then it would be a travel time of like 65 minutes. Right? Exactly, because then uh, 2,000 drivers would have taken this road and that would have taken 20 minutes and then they took 45, so that's 65 and likewise, um, 2,000, uh, yeah, 2,000 drivers would have taken C to D, C to B, sorry, and then that would be 65. Um, so yeah, when we give them uh, more options here, they end up doing worse, which is interesting. And they say that this actually occurs uh, also in real life. So it's, so it's fun, uh, both from an academic perspective and like an application of game theory um, versus paradox. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I feel like it's one of those, um, one of those things where uh, it will, I mean, number one, of course, it means that incentives and like, you know, incentives really, really matter in, in those kinds of cases. Um, and, but also just like one benefit of looking at these problems is I definitely have been able to kind of like, you know, you build up this little repertoire, I think. I think that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, of just like how to consider different scenarios because it's gonna be like, trying to apply this stuff to cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. I think we're going to, I mean, it's gonna be non-trivial just to formulate these problems. Like, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know how to formulate um, a lot of these problems into games where we can kind of like reason about them. I don't know, that just seems like a, a, a difficulty, but maybe this is like how you just like- Like, like the problem we just saw, for example, or? the problems that you see in smart contracts yeah like you you take the problem you see in a smart contract and then you want to formulate that as a game mm -hmm. and the way you do that maybe is just the you take these games that are kind of like the boilerplate games and you see oh does it fit this does it fit that does it fit this and then you kind of like combine and uh, or at least use combine the strategy the uh, the kind of general concepts of them. Although I don't know, maybe there's just that one-to-one -one, like you were talking about where you can just like see what the smart contract is, how the smart contract is coded and create a game outside, out of that, I don't know. Yeah, um, it is an interesting question. And I think Carl, if you have some time, you should, you should code up some games in smart contracts, like the, the beauty contest game uh... on, and like, uh, do an experiment with it. I know that there were some experiments that Gnosis got a grant for, uh, for trying out some game theoretic scenarios. But like doing the beauty contest, I think would be a lot of fun. But there is the problem that, well, I mean, you need to like make the players uh, commit uh, their, their bets. So in order to make it so that not everybody sees what everybody is guessing and then, you know, it's trivial to figure out what, the answer is going to be well speaking of that um, uh -huh. let me shortly uh, share my screen <laughs> commit reveal voting <laughs> Nice. <laughs> loading solidity commit so you know you got the commits uh, you know you you commit your hash and then you reveal your hash after the reveal phase and so nice. if you wanted to implement the um, the the beauty contest um, currently, the way that I'm doing it is I have a, uh, a commit vote, right? And, and the way that the votes are formulated is they're basically, um, you just hash it using a website, generating hash, and you, you say, you write something like one, my secret password, or two, my other secret password, right? So that you can just easily do that um, and turn it into a beauty contest where you do a number, which is your, 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 your bet, so. Anyway, nice. Little, little uh, if, if that is not published yet. No, it's published. So you can go oh, cool. check it out, Carl.tech. Um, everybody, nice. subscribe, nice. sign up for your email list, donate 100 Ether. <laughs> awesome. 
Did you see, and now we're diverging from game theory, but I mean, it's still relevant to the voting schemes and everything, but uh, did you see this stress test? People were going to try a voting scheme on Bitcoin um, and they didn't want to do it on Ethereum because there was going to be a huge load on the system. Uh, is, yeah, I, I, saw, I didn't read why. It seemed like they were just, it was a huge load on the system. What, is that, what, do you, what does that even mean? Um, I mean, he didn't go into detail very much. Like, I can see if I can find it again. Uh, but it was like a hot post on, on Bitcoin where, uh, yeah, so here it is. So... Um, he, he said, why we don't use Ethereum? I mean, it's in, in this fact, so he has obviously considered it seriously. Um, uh, that he think that, so the stress test will produce 150 gigabytes of data. But then at another point, he says that only like three megabytes will be added to the blockchain. So I'm not sure, like I, I think they have built some sort of secondary layer, um, yeah. like a, like a state channel type of deal. Uh, yeah, that seems that seems crazy. Um, I think he's. I think he's just. I don't think he's, he's educated. Um, no, maybe Sorry, I'm you just, don't think that he's educated? I mean, I don't think like you. Ethereum can't handle the load, but Bitcoin can. Mm. Like that just seems strange. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, he has obviously built it in such a way that that uh, the load is not on the blockchain for any of the systems. So I'm also a bit confused why, like, he chooses to when maybe, when he's doing this thing. Off may, may, maybe what what he's saying is that um, he has abstracted so much off chain that it doesn't really matter if it's Ethereum or Bitcoin and just Bitcoin because because why not? Yeah. I think that, that might that be makes the, sense. Probably. But then he shouldn't say that he can't do it on Ethereum because he's like implying that you can do it on Bitcoin. But I mean, he's just doing it on Bitcoin because it doesn't matter. So I think it's just the price of ETH went too high and they were like, all right, we, <laughs> let's, let's say that Bitcoin can do something that ETH can't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It seems to be an interesting thing like... Um, he doesn't say much about like uh, what he is doing, but he uh, talks about David Deutsch's uh, The Beginning of Infinity, which is a dope book. So <laughs> I'm really, uh, th that made me uh, think of him as an educated person that he was like flattering my ego by uh, saying that books that I like are good. So that was nice. I'll keep that in mind when I wanna uh, like get, your, get you on my side. <laughs> man i hate hol um but uh <laughs> but uh tiba do you have any like uh questions um general questions that uh i mean to be I, like i think we we've kind of gone over at least some of the things for this chapter and i i don't really know i should i need to dive in deeper to this chapter to be honest. yeah i mean we should spend uh more weeks on uh chapter five like since I started reading um, section two, I can like say something about it, but, but not in great detail. And I'm sharing my screen because you all are gonna ask me to do it. So here we go. Um, uh, like, Kurnaut, Kurnaut, or however he pronounces his name, um, has a pretty interesting model and, and I think this is like gonna be uh, generalized and uh, go into more into depth throughout section two of this chapter. Uh, but it's basically a, a model of two firms and you know markets of, of goods that will end up having a certain price and um, I guess this is like um, what is his name? Uh, uh, the, the invisible hand guy, is Adam something. Adam Smith. Adam wow. Smith, yeah. So this is like Adam Smith's invisible or uh, wet dream, this result it seems. Because like, um, 
he shows that you can have a market equilibrium um, in the sense that uh, the optimal price, uh, well, let me just read it for you. A market equilibrium exists when a quantity demanded at price P is, uh, and now these are the quantities produced by the two firms, uh, Q1 plus Q2, and the firms will optimally produce the quantities Q1, Q2 at price P. So it's like telling us that the market is a good mechanism for actually uh, optimizing the uh, the utility functions of, of uh, players, which is what Adam Smith would be very happy to hear. Um, but also that this can only be done and like in, in order to actually figure out these things, um, the firm's profit depends on the costs of the other firm, uh, which is reminiscent of a fact that I don't know much about, but I've heard that you can have a part perfect market only if you have perfect information. And so perfect information is pretty rare in the real uh, world. And so maybe that would be a counter argument for why uh, the open market isn't really the best strategy for reaching uh, Nash equilibrium. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's fun how <laughs> from different examples of this book, you're like shifting between wanting to be, uh, wanting to have a free market to like a uh, top-down controlled market. Like when we're looking at the examples with the Bessis um, paradox and, and we see that, or just uh, prisoner's dilemma and we see that when everybody is acting in their own self-interest, they're not gonna have the best uh, payoff combined, then it makes you wanna be a communist and when you get results like the free market is working, then you're like, oh, maybe we should all do capitalism instead. Well, what a, I mean, I, my personal thing that I'm interested in is the fact that you have Mr. Robot videos on your computer. Now, the thing that, I, <laughs> the thing that I'm interested in is like um, using the free market for um, building, for, for uh, creating the regulation around uh, like the top-down control. Right. So like you use the kind of perfect information, free market, assuming that everyone knows how to code and everyone can like read all the code, which is not really true. Um, but like, that's why I, at least I'm somewhat, it appeals to me the idea of having um, like a open system where everyone can create their own kind of regulation and their solutions to prisoners, dilemma problems and the, the paradox while um also uh so you, you so you have that kind of like the top down stuff but then above the top down stuff is the kind of meta control of a free market of like people a lot, uh, agreeing to the regulation you know opting into regulation and um people being able to deploy their own regulation and fork regulation you know that kind of stuff yeah definitely and like when you phrase it like that it's really epitomizing why blockchains are the best thing ever because we're gonna hybridize like uh, the planned market and the free market and we're gonna make it the blockchain market where everybody is incentivized to form the best coalitions and so if it is a coalition consisting of everybody participating in the game then you have basically a, a top-down control system but you can like form these coalitions and in, in arbitrary sizes in order to uh, make your um, payouts to be optimal. So hopefully we're just gonna optimize the payout function of humanity <laughs> and like, it's gotta be pretty great. <laughs> exactly, and so, um, uh, wait, let me, uh, let's, if this will stop, it's okay. I'm gonna stop sharing your screen because I'm a jerk. So this is, uh, if you wanna read more about the, this uh, idea, then, <laughs> then read the post uh, introduction to the <laughs> to ethereum internet's government where i start to lay out it's really just like this is based on 
tar I'm trying to like uh, target uh, people who don't know um, about uh, Ethereum, but like the the kind of idea is you create and enact laws, right? You just like write your stuff, your code, and then you you enact it by sending it to the network, and then um, for following laws, everything, all the laws are opt-in, so you can like follow this law or that law or follow multiple, and then you can't break laws unless you kind of like choose to not kind of to ignore them or whatever. I mean, you can kind of get it tied into dependencies if you're like a identity on a smart contract. But anyway, to your government. I'm, I'm trying to rebrand re governments though because people hate, <laughs> hate governments. So that's the problem. But this is what I, this is what I care about, right? Like having an open market for governance um, and, and like a, the free market for governance where we can create top-down regulation. Um, I think that's yeah. a really nice middle ground for, um, for uh, like, you know, making the world a better place. Yeah, definitely. And those are some slick graphics that you have on your page, Carl. Did you make them yourself? I did, I did. I spent countless hours in Sketch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and VecDeasy, there you can find a lot of great top-notch vector art, and then you just use Sketch and you like combine it. Nice, nice. That's very nice. Um, but so I missed a little bit, and I don't know if we want to say something more about game theory, and then now it's the time. But otherwise, I would like to ask a little bit about what happened in the Isabel uh, study session. Uh, Tivo, do you have any things? This is what happens when we don't do enough game theory for a week. We just like, we do a little bit and then we reach the kind of point that we've learned and then we go into like random. Um, but anyway, it's fun. Uh, do you have any questions, Tivo, or no? You're good? Uh, I'm good. I'm happy to, to hear about the Isabel group. Cool. So um, the Isabel group, we, uh, it's, it, we did our first session. You didn't really miss much. Number one, it's, it's on, on the web. Uh, it's on YouTube, um, but two, uh, we just went over like syntax essentially, right? Like like what kind of theorem provers and like what they're for and why they're good, and then the syntax of Isabel and like how to kind of generally maneuver through it, how to use Sledgehammer um, to kind of generate proofs, um, and you know a number of like really kind of things that you probably. Uh, someone who's used theorem provers before and Isabel before uh, already knows. Um, but my hope is uh, that with Isabel we can, uh, or at least I, I'm really interested in using Isabel for. Uh, well, I mean we've all I've I've already seen like a Yoishi do uh, formally verify uh, Vitalik's version of Casper and. Um, nearly formally verify um, uh, Vlad's version of Casper. So, I mean, that's really, really cool and got me interested. Yeah, nice. Seems pretty like a good thing to do. What are you, what are you, uh, are you interested in getting something out of uh, Isabel or your, uh, like, do you, I mean, yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know. There was a nice um, thing that I saw UHU do also, which was that he had formalized the semantics of the EVM in a language called LEM, which was triggering me that it was called LEM because I always think of LEM as the law of the excluded middle. And I don't know, I have a, uh, a uh, complicated relationship with the law of the excluded middle. Uh, but anyway, the LEM language is... A language then that allows you to translate these proofs uh, executable map into um, Isabel, Koch, uh, or a few other languages that I didn't remember. So um, that was nice. I haven't heard of, I hadn't heard of that language before. Oh, that's cool. And what what would be the what's the use of having it expressed in that language? Uh, like the use would be that people like me that prefer maybe Cock over Isabel can write proofs in Cock and people that prefer, prefer Isabel can write proofs in Isabel. I see. And then they both get converted to this. Um, it, it, it's, which, which direction are we going? Are we going from Lamb to Isabel slash Cock or are we going from Isabel to Lamb to Cock? 
I don't know in details in, in which directions you can go, but I know that if you have it in LEM, then you can go to... To both of those. Okay. Yeah. And also, in, you can uh, convert it into LaTeX, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Isabel can do that, right? Like, that's... Yeah, they can. And, cool. like, Hawk and I can do that also. And that's what happens when, when you see, like a, 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 like, a research paper, and it's essentially just, like, massively long, and just, like, equation after equation after equation, and you're like, well, how the hell are these people human? Like, how did they write this? It's because it's all in, like, Isabel and generated yeah, from that. and so, actually, they're not humans. They have just, um, their computer has actually written that. <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. 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 Well, um, so next week, number one thing, I think, is doing, uh, uh, getting the, um, uh, what is it called? Oh, I forgot it again. Um, Gambit? Gambit, yes. That I think is really important. Um, and two, maybe uh, go over the rest of, or parts of chapter five, I assume? Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, let's say maybe sections three throughout or as long as we can get. Sure. Awesome. Cool. And, and, and Tiva, please like, feel free to, um, uh, like, if you go through stuff and you have questions, I think that it would be, it's, you know, Martin and I may be going through chapter five, section, whatever. Um, but if, if there's a question on a different chapter and a different section and we don't know the answer, then it's like good for us anyway. Um, yeah, 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 cool. Sounds cool. I'm still catching up, by the way, but um, making good progress. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for yes. coming and, and enduring my advertising. Um, I'm officially a sponsor of the show. Nice. Good stuff. Okay. Well, have a good week. Have a good week. Peace out, guys. All right. See ya. Yes.